You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Yes, it is time once again for TWIFO this week in Futures Options. My name is Mark Longo. I will be your host, your guide, your mater d' through this hour-long, right about there, journey through the world of all things Futures Options. Remember, for this show, for all of our shows on the network, make sure if you like what you hear, keep those reviews coming in your platform of choice. So new folks especially now in these troubled times, can discover this content and put it to work if they're out there. Maybe they're one of these new Robin Hood traders that's flooding the market, all the other rash explosion of retail out there. They need a place to go. So leave those reviews so other folks can continue to discover the program. Of course, keep those questions coming, too. We do love to hear from you guys. And let's see who we're hearing from today. Once again, joining me, holding down the FTSE Russell hot seat today, our old friend Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Mr. Smith, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's, I'm looking forward to a great show. And also joining us for, uh, it's got to be a new record here, at least in the near term here. He's just devouring the CME Group hop seat once again, Mr. Dan Gramza, the president of Gramza Capital Management. Dan, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. It has been too long. What's it been, a couple of weeks? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's been a couple of weeks, way too long, and I'm really excited about being here. Thank you for the invite. Someone behind the scenes must like you, Dan, because you keep getting rotated into that hot seat, sir. Clearly, you're doing something right, sir. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you. It's great to be with you and Sean. You know, I, I really uh, am excited about having a chance to share some ideas today. Yeah, I hear you got some good ideas, so let's get to those. But before we do that, we have to kick it off the way we always do with a little bit of the old movers and shakers. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is moving and shaking this week over there at CME Land. What's going to the upside, what's dropping to the dark side, and everything in between. Remember, you guys, as always, can play along with the home game, cmegroup.com slash twifo. You can follow along with the reports we talk about. So if you want to look at the This Week in Futures Options reports for corn or for wheat or whatever the heck floats your boat, equities, energy, we don't judge here, fluid milk. (laughs) <laughs> we got it all there, some of them more so than others in terms of options volume, but you can do that all. com slash twyfo or slash twyo is the place to go to begin your journey. And speaking of beginning our journeys, Dan, where should we begin this week? To the light side or to the dark side, sir? You know, I usually do the light side, but I'd like to take a step on the dark side today. What do you have there for us? <laughs> All right. I had a feeling Ooh. you might be going that way this week. I don't know. I just felt that about you this week, Dan. You felt like a little bit of giving off a little bit of dark side of the force energy to me today. It's another week where it's pretty evenly split, listeners, between uh, upside and downside here on the old movers and shakers reports. Let's go to the dark side as requested. Before we break into the top five, we have to take a quick sojourn outside the top five to number seven. That's where we find the E-mini Russell 2000, a rear week where it isn't uh, dominating the tape in one direction or the other off. Not quite 2%, about 1.86%. In a quieter week, that probably would be enough to make it into the top five. But not this week, because a lot of stuff moving and shaking to the upside and to the dark side. Number five to the dark side is heating oil, off about 2.5%. Number four, the old NASDAQ 100 E-mini, the loan equity, making it into our movers and shakers report this week, off a little bit north of that, 2.56%, just enough for number four. Number three, lean hogs. Lean hogs off about 3.5%. It was number four to the upside in the other direction last week, up about 3.6%. So interesting couple of weeks out there in lean hog land. Numero dos here. We got feeder cattle off not quite 5%, 4.86%. And number one to the dark side this week is live cattle. So Bad week in the livestock range. They're off almost 5.5% this week. Now we'll switch to the upside iron ore. Not one we talk about a lot here on the show. Up 2.8%. Number four, corn. Up three, almost three and a quarter percent. It was number five to the light side last week. So a couple of good weeks for corn. It was up about 2.5% last week. Number three, oats. Once again, back to the ags, up 3.4%. Number two, soybean meal. Seeing a bit of a trend here in the upside this week, up 4.33%. And number one, you guys ask about this one every week, no matter if it's in the top five or bottom five or not. You want to know where it lines up. Well, it just so happens to be number one with a bullet this week. It is Bitcoin, up 11.5%. It was number three to the upside. Last week, we saw some interesting developments on that front. Bitcoin has been trending up of late. I do believe PayPal announcing this week they're going to start taking Bitcoin as well, so that giving it a nice little pop. Of course, you can check out all things Bitcoin and indeed crypto on our Crypto Rundown program every Monday out there. All right, we have a lot to break down here, a lot of products to get to, but before we get to those, I want to kick things off in equities land because it is that time of the year we are coming up against it here in terms of the election a lot of interesting things looming on the horizon i know dan has a lot in his back pocket he wants to share but all things equity and volatility particularly around the election too so without further ado let's get to it a little bit of the old equities it's time to explore the volatility swings skew changes and hot options trades in your favorite indices it's time to talk equities All right, like the man said, it is time to talk equities. Let's set the table here, listeners. Another weird day on the equities front. Seemed like most of the major indices were in red and sell-off mode earlier in the day. Maybe some weakness over the jobless claims. It does seem like there might be some hope on the stimulus front, though, and that seems to maybe be lifting indices coming into showtime. We had seen most of the major indices had flipped to the green today. And coming into showtime, we saw our old friend RVX, a.k.a. the VIX, Of the Russell 2000 at about a 33 and roughly a third. That puts it up pretty much exactly a point from this time last week. VIX was a little bit north of 27.5, about 27 double. That puts it up pretty much half a point from where it was this time last week. Our old friend VVIX 
actually down a little bit. Of course, VIX is the volatility of volatility listeners down about five points. So it was threatening 120 last show, this time at about a 114 and a half. And then one of our newer friends, VolQ, a.k.a. the volatility of the NASDAQ 100. At the money, just the facts, ma'am. No skew, nothing else out there. At about a 32.15 or so. Puts it down a little over a point, about a point and a third from this time last week. Of course, those futures out there and trading now over there on CME. We'll have some, I think we'll have Tim McCourt come on the show in the near future to discuss all things VolQ in a little while. And of course, that spread, that VIX RVX spread, Widening out, but just a little bit. It was about five points exactly on the show last week. And uh, coming to this show, it's not quite six, about 5.8 points. So about not a little bit north of three quarters of a point wider than it was this time last week. So that's a lot of table setting. Dan, I know you have a fun trade you want to get to in a second. But first, uh, Mr. Sean, sir, what is lighting up your tape this week in the world of equities and all things small cap, sir? Just, uh, it, it continues just to to be one of those volatile, volatile weeks. It's going to continue. Um, we've had a busy media buzz week. Uh, uh, Dan and I have, we've been, uh, we've been kind of all over the globe digitally. Um, we were, uh, uh, both on a panel together, uh, be, uh, with a conference being hosted by Borsa Italiana, um, and uh, talking about uh, some new micro indices coming out of Europe, coming out of Borsa Italiana on the on the MIFID. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm the I'm the uh, uh, Dan. Do you want to talk about that? The, um, well, it's an exciting product. I think that you know more and more exchanges are realizing that. Uh, there may be a window of opportunity with a smaller contract. And the Borsa Italiana launched a micro uh, MIB contract, FTSE MIB contract FTSE MIB. Uh, this week. Yeah. And it was really, uh, so far it's had a pretty good reception. Uh, I think yesterday they did a thousand contracts. And uh, I, the day that we were together, Sean, I think that was the, actually the official launch of the product. And it right. seems to be, you know, gathering some steam. What I find interesting about the micro contracts is who comes to it? You know, if you look at the CME's experience, which was, to me, very unique and uh, never seen before. The first six days, they s- traded six million contracts. But what they also find is that the mini contracts, the volume's not changing. So it looks at the... Retail trader, I think, the, the equity trader who said, you know, I always wanted to do something with futures or I'm not really comfortable with too much of a capital equi- uh, commitment. So the micro provides that opportunity for a much less capital, one-tenth the amount of capital in the CME and one-fifth the amount of capital in the Borsa Italia that was uh, launched this week. But, you know, Sean, you said something on Tuesday that I found excellent, and it really, I've never heard anybody else speak to it, and that was when you talked about how institutions look at these new micro contracts. Would you mind sharing that? No, I'm I'm happy to, and it's it's quite an interesting uh, 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 thing to note in regards to micro futures, and that is Institutions that uh, use uh, futures to equitize into the marketplace, um, options traders that look to hedge their deltas, um, have, have now the ability with micros to take that hedge uh, to to down to the to the granular delta. Uh, investors that are looking to equi- equitize their portfolios can now take their equitization. Uh, uh, to not not just a, a large notional value of a futures contract, but a much smaller, so that they can really take that equitization without any rounding and have it to the almost to the penny of the amount of money that they need to invest in a in a certain index. And with the with the Russell Micro uh, investors have been able to Fuji Russell Micro, they've been able to do that. So there's this institutional. Um, uh, blend into the marketplace. Uh, you, you think a micro is something that is uh, really uh, uh, pointed towards the retail market, but institutional traders have found this very, very interesting way of of really granularly 
hedging and in being in investing. So it's 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 quite a phenomenon. It sure is. It, it's something that people don't expect. Now, and what we do know, what institutions do when they want access or when they get capital infusion, uh, they don't necessarily go to the stock market. I mean, if we, if you and I were a pension fund and we got $300 million 15 minutes before the close, are we going to try to push that $300 million into the stock market, into our portfolio? Possibly not. It could be disruptive. You may not get filled on everything, but you can easily do it with futures. And when they want to adjust their position, they can sell off those futures and leave their portfolio alone. And I think you're adding another dimension in here that people just don't think about the institutions participating in, and that's fine-tuning their trades. And it's also where if they have a time-sensitive outlook, they can use options, not only them, but us too. That's where options can really come into play to either hedge an exposure we have. So let's say you and I are going into a report and we have profit. Well, maybe we do something simple, uh, which I've done in the past, and that is you buy puts for the day of the report. And if it comes out bearish and the market goes down, you have some protection. And if it goes up, you get rid of that put. It, it's such a useful tool to help us manage that risk. And, you know, we can do some of the things that those institutions do. I just find it interesting that they're looking at these micro products. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's just not talked about. Well, let's see what some of these institutions and indeed the retail are up to out here on the options front this week. Let's kick it off here in the Russell 2000. Remember, you guys see me, group.com slash twifo or slash twi. You can see all this data for yourself for free. You can't beat the price. And uh, coming into showtime, almost half, about 43% or so of the paper out there in the Russell 2000 going up in the DEES contract. That future is at about 1624 and a half, so north of that 1600 level, even though it's off slightly here on the week today, listeners. And let's see, that at the money vol, if you're wondering out there in the D's contract, a little bit shy of 30, about 29 and change. So a little bit juicy, a little bit frothy out there in all things small caps. In terms of the skew, we're seeing the puts course bid. They were 18.5% risk to get the money last week. This week, a little bit more bid, about 19.2%. Calls, almost 14%. Cheap last week, this week, about 13%. So calls coming in a little bit, puts getting crushed a little bit <laughs> out there. Let's, let's see what the action was out here this week. It was pretty far out of the money calls. Remember, I said we're at almost 16.25, and it was the 17.75 calls in December that were leading the dance out here to the tune of about 1,500 or so contracts out here. That was kind of where most of the action was, which is a little bit surprising. Again, we said it before out here in the Russell 2000, at least on CME. People seem to like to aggregate their liquidity in their farther out of the money puts. And yet we're seeing decent upside calls leading the dance out here this week, which is kind of interesting and maybe a little bit surprising. Sean, any of that surprise you, sir, before we get to Dan's hot election trade, sir? Um, you're, you're hitting it right on the mark. It's just, uh, um, I, I, you know, you, you just do such a good job, Mark. It's kind of hard to kind of add color to, to your description there. So I'm just going to let's get into Dan's trade. All right, Dan, we've been waiting for some time. You've been teasing us. You have this mythical trade that comes around, oh, once every four years, sir, around election time. Maybe more frequently than that. Maybe you can do it around congressional elections, too. I don't know. I suppose we'll find out. Mr. Dan, sir, the floor is yours. What are you up to for this very brief, this small window on election day, sir? Well, thank you very much. And by the way, the Russell, I believe, is the index to watch right now. We are seeing, from my point of view, some very interesting characteristics today. It does imply an update tomorrow. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the debates tonight. But let's talk about this presidential election, as you mentioned, Mark. What are some of the characteristics that you and I can look at? I think there's just a, a couple observations I'd like to share, and then also a possible trading idea that we could look at as well. Uh, the, the first idea is that when it comes to presidential election cycles, there are certain beliefs about what should happen, when it should happen, what the president tries to do. 
And one of those beliefs is that the year of the election, that it's very important for the S&P 500 in that case, but I think it really applies to other indices. Uh, But that's a typical benchmark, and that is that if it's positive, it's going to say something about the election. I I just don't find that to be a, 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 a consistent barometer. And the reason I say that is if you go back to 1928, well, there's only been four times that we've had negative years in the S&P 500 for the election year. Just four times since 1928. And, and it didn't change anything. 1932, Roosevelt had a negative uh, year when uh, for the S&P 500. He got elected. He got elected again in 1940. The other two times was 2000, Bush versus Gore. Uh, the market was down, and Bush you know, won that election. The last one we had was Obama against McCain, and Obama won. Uh, and that was 2008. So that's one characteristic I don't think is super reliable. But we'll hear probably more talk about that. The other one is this. And I'm going to take out the Roosevelt years. So let's start with uh, let's start with 1952. And how many Demo- how many what would you say presidential parties in other words, Democrat or Republican, do we have in a row? In other words, 1932 to 1948, the Democrats were the, the presidential party for all those years. Since 1948, what party do you think held two or not two, let's say three or more presidential uh, terms? What surprised me with it is this. If you look, starting in 52 now, you had two terms for Republicans, then you had two terms for Democrats, two terms for Republicans, two terms, well, sorry, 1976, you had one term for a Democrat, that was Carter. Then you had Reagan era, two terms for Reagan, one term for Bush. And then you had two Clinton, two Bush again, to Obama, and now we have Trump. So the Reagan 1980 to 88 was the only other time a party controlled the White House for three terms. So every two terms, basically, we have switched to the other party. And it'll be interesting to see if Trump survives to get to that second term. But now, what I'd like to talk to you about is a different parameter. I have two more thoughts. And the, the next one is, can the stock market, can the stock market track record give us an idea about the outcome of presidential election? Now, I said before that most people look at the year of the presidential election. Well, there's something that LPL Financial did, which I think is really interesting, and since 1928, the S&P 500 correctly predicted the winner 87% of the time. Since 1984, the stock market correctly predicted the winner of each U.S. presidential election. So how can we use the S&P 500 or probably other indices as well to better judge whether the president Trump or former Vice President Joe Biden will likely win the election on November, November 3rd. Here's the, the concept for this idea. By following the price movements of the market in the three months leading up to the election. Now, not the year, but the three months. So when the S&P has been higher, the three months before the election, the incumbent party usually won. When the stocks were lower, the incumbent party usually lost. Now, this has been true except three times. 1956, when Dwight Eisenhower was reelected, even though the S&P fell by 3.2% the three months before the election. 1968, when the incumbent Democratic Party lost to Richard Nixon. 
despite the S&P rising 6% in the three months before the election. And then the last time that this didn't work was in 1980 when the incumbent Democratic Party lost to Ronald Reagan, even though the S&P went up 6.9%. But remember, that was when we had the Iran hostage situation. In 68, we had the you know, the uh, Democratic uh, uh, Party uh, convention in Chicago, which had some problems, and we had Vietnam War. But other than that, uh, it's been accurate. So as we finish this month out, pay some attention to the return on the S&P 500 for those three months leading up to the election. So that's something else just to take a peek at. There's another idea that I'd like to share, and this is one that I have been looking at since, I think, at least since 2000. And what I find interesting about it is that it works not only in our indices in our country, but I also did a study on the DAX uh, in Europe, and that's a German index, and it worked there as well. But here, here's what you look at. So let's say it's now election day. And what I'm going to tell you has nothing to do with the outcome. So there's no correlation to this. It is just what I found as a characteristic. And the characteristic is this. The day of the election, you and I look at the Russell. The stock indices have a tendency when the U.S. market opens, our time zone, 8.30 Chicago time, it'll have a tendency to go up. Now, and then it, this trade will last about an hour, hour and a half. And it may not start up immediately. Some years it has. Uh, it just starts moving higher. And then we go sideways typically because nobody knows what's going on. And then we typically go down. This is what happened in 2016 when they said the exit polls that Clinton was going to win. And then around Asia time, uh, we saw the market going up as they got election results. So typically, we don't see the reality of the election until Asia time zone, after the U.S. markets close, because they have to collect all the data. And that's one of the advantages of these markets that you and I are looking at, is that they allow us to see what happened in Asia, what happens in Europe, and what comes back to us. So whether we're looking at options or futures, it gives us that 23-hour window. Let's go back to the beginning. So if we were going to look at this, and I'm not suggesting that anyone does this, but a possibility would be to capture that up move in the stock indice. So if we're looking at the Russell, that means that in that first hour and a half, we should see the Russell getting stronger. And again, it has nothing to do with the outcome. And I don't know why it does this. And maybe it's just this simple. Maybe it's, you know, we got an election in the United States. It's a presidential election. Our system is working. It's a good thing. Whatever the outcome, it's a good thing that we're having this presidential election. And maybe that's why we see this positive movement. So what we could now think about is how do we take advantage of that? Well, any bullish strategy would allow you to do that. If I did a vertical, bullish vertical spread, if I did something as simple as buying a call, oh, only on the call on a personal basis, I would want that delta near 100. I don't want something with a, a delta 5 or something like that because it's cheap. I'm willing to pay for that. Uh, and the reason is if this is going to work, I want it to work out of the get-go. I want to get paid for the trade. This is not an all-day trade. This is something, again, that lasts an hour, maybe hour and a half, depending how the market responds at that beginning. So those are just a couple thoughts about this presidential election. 
you look at the year before the election, not necessarily a good barometer. If you look at the three months leading up to the election, hmm, that seems to have had a, a fairly good mark in terms of the outcome of the uh, election. And then the third idea is to look at the very beginning of our election day to see if we do see that very consistent behavior. And that is a movement up in about the first hour, hour and a half. So those were the ideas I wanted to share. I, I found them interesting for me, and uh, I hope other people have a chance to take a look at some of those ideas. Thank you for that, Dan. A little bit of a historical perspective on looking at the election, maybe some potential positioning and or just uh, ways to look at the election through an interesting frame of reference out there. Speaking of frame of reference, we like to do our movers and shakers, and it highlighted some ags this week. And I know you guys out there are always asking for more of pretty much every product, so whatever it is, metals, rates, uh, ags, energy, that you want more of it every week. But I know you definitely want some more ags. Let's get to that a little bit. Number four on our upside this week, corn was up 3.22% since our last show. So let's start there. Corn obviously does a wee bit of paper, and this week's doing a little bit more. It's over half a million contracts uh, on the tape right now, doing about, looks like about 500 and 42,000. So pretty active week out here in the land of corn. That corn future, if you don't follow all things corn, is at about a 415.75 right now out there. Listeners, and in terms of where the action was this week, not quite half, but pretty close to it, 42% of the action coming in that Dece contract, which has about 29 days to go. If you're wondering what the uh, at the money vol out there in Dece is in corn, it's about a 26, which puts it up a little over a point. From last year. That's pretty frothy. We were just talking about Dece Vol in the Russell 2000, and those are small caps, which are by definition pretty volatile. That was about a 29, and the Dece Vol in corn at about a 26. So corn's pretty frothy from a vol perspective out here. Let's see what's going on from a skew perspective out here this week in all things corn. And let's see, the puts last week were kind of, eh, kind of unched to the at the money. They're about 1.5% cheap. Not a heck of a lot going on out there, but a little bit of a swing this week coming in quite a bit, down about to about 7.6% cheap. So coming in, oh, a good six handles from this time last week. So someone out there obviously crushing the puts in the Dece corn. Also looking at the calls, calls kind of unch, not a lot of action in the calls. Calls were almost 5.5% rich last week. This week, about 5.1%. So not a big swing in the calls, but a pretty sizable swing in the puts. Let's see if the options activity, the hot trades out here this week, can shed a little bit more light on it. And yeah, number one with the bullet out here this week came on the put side. Probably helps that that 400 strike, that even money strike, is now in the rearview mirror, at least to the dark side. That's, of course, a lot of people like to make their trades, and that was the case this week as well. On both sides of the ledger, the 400 calls and puts were pretty active. But number one with the bullet was the puts with about 25,000. The big day was Tuesday, nearly 10,000 going up on Tuesday, about 4,000 on Wednesday. Actually, I take that back. A lot going up today as well, 9,700 as well today. So almost even with Tuesday. Obviously, we don't have numbers on today's paper. But Tuesday was a good chunk of opening paper out there, Wednesday and Monday as well opening. So Opening paper on these 400 put strikes, given what we're seeing out there in the skew, I'm going to go out on a limb and say some folks may be crushing some bids <laughs> out there, but uh, interesting stuff. Number two out there was the 400 calls. Again, action on both of those strikes could be uh, crushing this uh, vol skew out here. We saw the uh, 400 calls doing 21,500 contracts. The lion's share also on Tuesday, about 10,500. Good chunk of those. Closing, so probably as you break through that 400 strike, maybe some folks taking those bad boys off. So that also could be to blame for this uh, now put wing coming in a little bit. You have these calls, you blow through the strike, and now they're pretty meaty in the money calls. You take them off. Remember, if it's a call or a put, doesn't matter. If it's below the add the money strike, it all factors in to what is effectively known as the put wing from a vol perspective out there. So that could be also contributing. We saw a lot of closing action pretty much every day this week on the 400 call side of the ledger. So that probably could be contributing to it as well. Also saw some action on the 420 calls, 20,400 of those, the big day. Also Tuesday, 6,000, almost 7,000 going up on Tuesday, slightly closing out there as well. So interesting stuff afoot out here. Dan, I don't know how much time you spend 
watching the ags, in particular corn. But corn is one of the more active products out there. And I know, given some of the ag heads on our listeners, one that doesn't get enough love here on the show. So hopefully they'll be happy we're talking about it. Uh, did this corn come on your radar, A? And if so, B, what are your thoughts on what's going on out there in uh, corn this week, sir? I, I do look at it. I do follow it. And it's our largest crop that we have in the United States, it's usually over 70 billion uh, worth in beans are around 50 to 60 billion and uh, wheat is uh, lower than that. If, if you look at corn in terms of where we are, and I, I think we need to think about it in terms of the global side of it. We need to look at South America, Brazil and Argentina, and also China. You know, China, we go back and forth about what they're going to buy and they're not going to buy. And now they came up with an agreement to to buy some of our farm products. Uh, the issue is, are they going to do it? It looks like they are. If you're, if you're China, your demand for corn and beans is huge. And you got to fill that out. And when they go out in the world to buy, just like you and I go into the store, they comparison shop. So they look at U.S., they look at Brazil, they look at Argentina. Those really are the big sources globally for corn and beans. And where do I get the best deal? What commitments do I have? Where, where's the currency with respect to those markets that, again, my bottom line is the best that I can get? And that's what we're seeing. Uh, the demand is there for corn. Uh, what I find also interesting, and Mark, you did a great job wrapping what's been happening out there, especially on these, you know, the $4 to the 420, 421. Uh, I, I think we're seeing a combination of people hedging, trying to lock in prices. You know, if you're a farmer here in Illinois, which grows a lot of corn, uh, your bank that you got your loan at uh, to buy the seed, maybe equipment, uh, they require a lot of farmers to hedge. And so the thing we want to keep in mind when it comes to that, and again, I think you did a great job laying that out, is that hedges are not static. And a lot of people get into trouble when they do that. They put the hedge on and say, okay, that's it. What you want to remember in futures, a hedge locks in a price. So if it goes above that price, you lose some money on the hedge. If it goes below that price, you make money on the hedge if you're trying to protect yourself against a downside. The advantage of those options that you laid out for us is that once I cover the cost of my premium, I can take advantage of the upside move. So we do see a lot of demand coming in there from a hedge point of view. And if the hedge is moving, in other words, if price is moving in my favor, let's do it that way. And if it's corn, you know, I want higher prices if I'm the farmer. So let's look at it from their point of view. If it's starting to move in my favor, maybe I take that hedge off. Whether I'm, if I'm using options, once I cover the put, I'm, I'm good. If I'm using futures, maybe I take the foot, the put, the, if I could say it, the futures position off. Uh, so I think that's some of the action that we're seeing surrounding corn. Uh, I think there's also some upside to, uh, possibilities here, uh, even though today we do see some buying and selling in here. Today's action, I think, price action reflected what you laid out for us, Mark, with the options. Well, thank you for that, sir. I'm looking here really quickly at some of the other movers and shakers. I like to shake it up a little bit here, pun intended, on the show and rotate in some other products that don't get a lot of love all the time. I'd love to hit on oats, but they don't really do a whole bunch of options. Paper out there, oats were number three uh, to the upside this week, up about 3.4%. Sorby meal does some paper. We could get there. Iron ore, of course, not really an option story at all. Number five, they're up nearly 3%. Seemed like a lot of livestock was dominating the dark side this week. Lean hogs, feeder cattle, and live cattle were number three, number two, and number one to the dark side. Maybe let's take a gander over that way. Livestock, not really a huge option story with the growing exception of our old friend Lean Hogs. Lean Hogs, ever since we started doing this show, has been coming on stronger and stronger as an overall options product. And this week, it's done about 33,500 contracts. So, Gone are the days of just a few thousand contracts here. They're actually doing a pretty decent paper out there. Again, it's not a euro dollars. It's not even a corn. 
but it's certainly not nothing either. So let's get on out there, see what was lighting it up out there. It's the Dees contract. Again, you're not going to have a surfeit of contracts out here in, in corn. You're not, or I should say in lean hogs. You're not going to have weeklies and everything else like that. It's pretty much Dees, and then it kind of goes out from there. So not a ton of choices when it comes to where to put your trades on. So Dees getting the lion's share of the paper, 65% of it going up in the Dees contract. So that 33,500 contracts this week, 65%. It's a pretty good clip. By the way, that Dees contract has about 53 days to go. And if you're wondering if you don't follow Lean Hogs every day, that front future is at about a 66.2. It's actually yeah, off pretty much a similar level since Monday as well. It's about 5.2%. Or so. Let's see. At the Money Vol. If you're curious what the At the Money Vol is in Lean Hogs right now, if you guessed a 37.68, I would say A, that's a weirdly precise prediction, and B, you are exactly correct. Up about two and a third handles from last week. So pretty volatile. I mean, we just talked about corn uh, almost at a 30, pretty close to it. We talked about small caps, Dees contract pretty much at about a 30. And now we're seeing uh, lean hogs north of that 37 and change, almost 38. So more juice in lean hogs than in those other two contracts, which I guess given this action out here of late is perhaps not that surprising. Let's look at the skew out here, the skew in lean hogs. Swinging all over the place, which makes it kind of interesting. Last week, it was nearly 9% cheap. The puts were last week to the at the money. This week, swinging hard in the other direction. Nearly 5% rich. So you're talking 14 points on the top there. So uh, that's a big move out there in all things puts on the lean hogs. Let's see if the calls can keep up. No, not a lot of action in the calls. The calls were about 6.6% cheap last week, this week. 4.5% 4.5% cheap. So all of the action in that Dees contract seemed like it came on the put side of the fence. Again, this is a lighter volume contract as well, listeners. So bear in mind, it doesn't take many contracts to make those move happen. And as I say that, as I say the big dog was the calls, uh, or was the puts, I should say. It was actually the calls that dominated the tape this week with uh, the 72 calls going up about 1,800 times. The big day was yesterday with about 700 or so out there. A lot of that closing. And the 75 calls with about 1,500. So upside calls and maybe verticals. The big day on the 75s was today with about 700 and change today. So maybe some verticals or maybe just some straight outrights on the 72 and 75 strikes. Both of those pretty sizable out of the money. They're both, uh, I said we're at about a 66 and change coming into today's show. Our first put comes in at about number four on the top five here. Actually, I take it back. It's number five. You got to go all the way down to number five to get to the 62 puts which had about 1,100 contracts out here this week. The lion's share actually on Monday, about 600 going up to a good chunk of that opening out there. Well, something was certainly swinging those puts out here this week and bidding them up quite a bit. So I'm assuming maybe it was those 62 puts, maybe it was the about 900 or so of the 65 puts that were going up out here this week. Either way, something really bid up <laughs> that put skew in the December Lean hogs out there. Let's look really quickly, see if any other weird prints. 70 puts were pretty active out there in April as well, doing about 1,300 contracts, which is a pretty big print for all things hogs out here. Dan, this is a more esoteric product, certainly not one that makes it on our radar every week, but livestock kind of dominating the dark side this week. Do you have any of your listeners or viewers over there on your YouTube channel, any of your clients and people you've trained over the years, any any big hog traders out there amongst them? And if so, what are your thoughts on this kind of topsy-turvy marketplace, sir? Well, I tell you, I've, I deal with a number of very large uh, companies in this area when it comes to meats and grains and uh, in our country, in South America, uh, if you look at what's happening now with hogs, it really surprises me. The last three days, we found sellers in this market. We were at significant highs when we po- pushed through 72 just a, three days ago, four days ago. Uh, but it failed to hold that. And what I find interesting, yesterday and the day before, a little bit of a pullback. We've seen that prior over the last few weeks. Hogs have really been in this uptrend. But today, a different kind of animal, no pun intended. But we do see some weakness there. And it, it, I have to say, it does surprise me. And it also leads us back to China. China is the world's largest producer and consumer of hogs. 
Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they need to buy grains in other countries to feed the, that hog uh, community that they have. And they've run into some problems. This past year, there is a, a swine flu that killed off thousands and thousands of their hogs. So not only do you have a demand shortage uh, or a product shortage, uh, you need to buy that meat someplace. And so I expect that higher price to be maintained. It's going to be interesting to see now how we move. Uh, Something with China that we want to keep in mind when we talk about meats and grains is that their consumption of protein is up about 500%. When I look at a country in terms of its economy changing, when you see people with disposable income that's going from a developing to more mature economy, that's where you see the consumption of protein going up. When people have more disposable income, they have a tendency to buy more protein. So they'll buy more meats. And that's what we've seen happening there. So even though we've had some down days here, uh, I'd be surprised if that could be maintained. So the options that you laid out for us, it'll be interesting to see, uh, maybe not by the end of this week, but next week on your program, if you're seeing the same kind of behavior that you're seeing now. So I I think uh, cattle as well as hogs are two interesting things to keep in mind. Something other that, uh, that you want to think about when it comes to meats is that if meat prices become down low enough that as a feedlot operator, someone who now the farmer has the cattle, let's say, or the hogs, they bring them to a feedlot. The feedlot fattens them up to the weight that are used for processing, and that's what the futures contracts are based on for cattle and then they're processed. Well, if it's costing us too much to feed that animal and we can't sell it for what it's costing us to feed it, they bring them to processing sooner. When they do that, for cattle, for example, it takes about two years to bring that herd back up to those levels. So there's a lead lag time in here that's built in when it comes to these kind of products. Well said, sir. Now let's see what you guys have in store for us. It's about that time, listeners. It's time for your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to your feedback segment. Let's see what you guys have on the brain. First off, we got Mr. Scott Nations chiming in. He was on our Option Block show. I believe he'll probably be on the show down in the future. He's, of course, the creator of these Vol Q futures that are now the latest addition to the equity volatility suite on CME by way of NASDAQ. Uh, he was chiming in on one of our shows recently saying, the futures markets in Vol Q are looking good. And are starting to, and we're starting to see interest in the back months as well. The Vol Q futures just listed a couple of weeks ago out there, so still a pretty new product. We're going to have, I do believe, uh, Tim McCourt from CME, and I do believe uh, Dan from uh, Nasdaq, I believe, on the show in the near future as well to talk about what's going on in those products and uh, what's interesting in the equity volatility space, in particular as it refers to Nasdaq. Everyone always talks VIX and large cap vol on the S and P 500 side. We try to talk. A lot of small cap vol here on the show as well. But it might be interesting to talk a little bit of NASDAQ as well. Uh, so we'll do that on an upcoming show. Glad to see that the futures are starting to look good, particularly in the back months. That's always an intriguing area to find some liquidity. Speaking of liquidity, we got a question here from Tim. Tim Masters, he wants to know. Uh, I'm curious how the overnight liquidity is in major futures options, particularly the, uh, the ES 
out there. I have a few put spreads on now, and I tried taking one off in the overnight session, and I had a hard time. Is this common, or did I just hit a bad night? No, I don't. I wouldn't say it's uncommon, Tim. Again, I'm always, and I'm not going to accuse you of this, Tim, but whenever people write into us with their questions about, hey, I couldn't take X, Y, and Z spread off, you always have to give us a little bit more details there. Sometimes people have sometimes uh, outlandish expectations of what they should get for a spread, and when they don't get it, they get a little bit up in arms out there. So sometimes you have to keep your expectations reasonable out there. That's always particularly important in some of the less liquid sessions, like the overnight session. You have to be a little bit more patient. You're going to have to expect a little bit wider, less liquid markets in general. And you're also going to have to expect, uh, probably have to wait a little bit more of a move to get someone to come in and hit whatever bid you're working or lift your offer. Now, there are some nuggets and pockets of liquidity you can probably lean on a little bit more. Those are, of course, the kind of the opening and closing periods for, let's say, the Asian markets or the European markets. Those should see some little bit more spikes of liquidity in those after hours. But in general, I think patience is probably a good virtue whenever you're trading in some of these less than liquid sessions. Dan, I know you like to hang out out in some of these overnight hours as well. What are your thoughts for Mr. Tim here about his problems taking off put spreads in the uh, S&P after hours, sir? Well, first, I think what you said, Mark, is right on target. It goes back to that expectation and what we don't know. We don't know the strike he was looking at. We're not sure about what he was trying to work. Was it something that was thin during the day even that now it's thinner at night? And if you and I want to trade a spread in options or however we want to trade the options, that's something to take into consideration it, it, what the beauty, as we all know, of options is that they're so flexible in terms of what we create. So something you might want to do is that as you're constructing your strategy, take a look at that overnight volume. Are you picking strikes and options that just are thin overnight? Or are you picking options that really have some liquidity so that if you do want to exit that position later in the day, or based upon where, here I am in Chicago, but if you're looking for the Asia session to get out, you might want to think about constructing your strategy around that time zone, as well as Europe, by the way, not just Asia, but Europe. So whatever you're looking at, do you have some volume so that you can exit when you're ready to do so. Yeah, for all we know, Tim here might be trying to take off, you know, Dece 2022, 20% out of the money put spreads or something like that. So <laughs> we have no idea what you're trying to take off here, Tim. But in general, I think counseling a little bit of patience and maybe working things a little bit more aggressively in the after hours is probably a good thing. Uh, Sean, I know he's asking about S&P, but do you have any thoughts about after hours liquidity and maybe what you guys are seeing over there on the Russell 2000 side for our friend here, Mr. Masters? Have at it, sir. It's actually a really good question from Tim Masters, and I, I have to stand right behind both of you on, on your answers, just both really informative and educational. You know, the, you, have to, you have to think about it from, uh, from the origination perspective, right? The, the, the underlying, uh, the stocks are closed uh, during those hours, so you have a, a really massively liquid futures contract, but it is thinner than it is during the, the open day session in the U.S., so you've got, and then we're going to the options, uh, to another derivative, right? So it's a derivative of the futures contract. So it's going to progressively get slightly thinner. Um, uh, great questions. Which expiry, like is it a front month uh, spread that you have on, which is usually the most liquid? Or are you, are you in another series further out, which, would, which are just always thinner by nature? So, you know, just a backup dance question. There's all these different things you need to look at. And then really prepare yourself for what, what the market looks like in that overnight session. So I, I just wanted to agree with you both. But, uh, again, um, the cash is closed, so there's uh, uh, slightly less liquidity in the futures, but good liquidity in the futures. Uh, but then it, it, it bleeds into the, the options trading as well. That, that only points I wanted to make. Great question here about uh, the overnights. It's one of the benefits. You know, you can't really do most of your standard, your Apple options, for example, or your Tesla, everything else you like to trade in the equity space. Those don't really have the after-hour session. So it is a benefit of going the futures options route that you can do that. Of course, you can't expect the same uh, tight markets that you're getting here in the middle of the session during the day. As long as you have that in mind and you're 
have a little bit of patience with what you're working out there. It's certainly better than no liquidity, which is the point I always make out there. Just bear in mind, it's going to be a little bit less than your traditional intraday session here in the U.S. hours. All right, next up, we got Sabres with a Z. I like this question. He, he or she wants to know, uh, maybe you guys could have a SKU alert service for WTI. When the SKU turns positive above the 40 strike, uh, you could send out an alert. <laughs> That it's finally time to buy crude again. A great shows. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome there, Sabres. I like your idea. It is because it is a barometer we've used quite a bit here. We didn't get a chance to talk WTI today because it wasn't really in our movers and shakers this week. But you're right. It has been a kind of frequent talking point for over a year now, ever since we saw the you know that really big bombing of the Saudi oil fields. And everyone thought that would really give crew to lift and it had a bit of a whimper and then it collapsed and of course we got into all the pandemic madness of 2020 and the race has been on to the downside ever since with the infamous foray into negative territory there earlier this year and yeah one of the common refrains has been man WTI can't really maintain a bid north of 40 for very long and whenever it does so the options tend to fade it pretty aggressively so maybe there could be something to that we'll have the a skew alert it'd be a pretty uh, dormant I think alert service for the better part of the year until that finally happens. It's one alert and then you put it on everyone. So maybe we'll do that, but it is kind of fun. We certainly keep an eye on it and uh, maybe we'll do something like that just for fun. Again, it'll be a, a one off thing and I can get a lot of alerts there. But when we start finally seeing people loading up on uh, upside calls aggressively in a little bit longer term in WTI, maybe that'll be a sign that. The worst of this madness of 2020, at least from an oil perspective, uh, will be behind us. All right, we'll come up again, so let's go to this one here. This comes from Miss Teagan. Miss Teagan wants to know, um, I'm looking to add Russell 2000 covered calls to my portfolio. Am I better off trading them in the E-minis on CME or on IWM or on the RUT over there on SIBO? Are there any major differences other than size? Well, size is a key one. Certainly, but Sean, these are all, or most of them at least I should say, are, are under your domain here. What do you have to say here for Miss Teagan, who's looking for the best place to do some covered calls on the Russell 2000, sir? Great question, um, um, uh, Miss Teagan. Um, you've got the E-minis on the CME, which are options on the futures. You have IWM, which are options on the ETF the uh, the iShares ETF the, the iShares ETF and you've got RUTs which are Russell options that are exclusively listed on SIBO. Um, there's differences between uh, option on a future and options on uh, on an index. Uh, you've got a, a an options product the CME's product expires into a future. IWM and RUT are are just settled uh, to the index. So you've got those differences. You've also got different regulatory uh, differences. So there's different rules. Um, you've got the CFTC uh, who manages the, the futures industry, and you've got the SEC who manages the securities industry, and IWM and RUT are considered securities. And Dan, Grams, if you, if you want to chime in, please add to this. But there's also uh, some tax implications. Don't know how you're set up uh, in terms of how you trade, but there are uh, you know, the 60-40 tax treatment when it comes to a futures uh, trade uh, and and there's a capital gain situation in regards to index index options. So there's and I am not the the person to talk to about taxes or uh, accounting. Please see your your uh, financial uh, uh, professional in regards to that. But there those are the the biggest nuances that I know of. I'll let Dan in case there was something yeah, else you wanted to add. I, well, the only thing that I would add, I think you hit some of those highlights when it comes to some of the differences between these products. Uh, I, I kind of lean towards the futures options. And even though we just talked about the liquidity and off hours, um, I still think it gives us more choices. So I, I prefer uh, the futures options because they're trading almost 24 hours a day. And again, I would prefer looking at options that have liquidity throughout the evening sessions. So I look at Asia and I look at Europe. I see that the strikes I'm looking at, there's somebody else that's also trading them. You know, there, there's been a, a fairly strong increase in the input of trading in the futures and the options outside of the U.S. hours. And I kind of like that idea of having a safety net. 
because, you know, if, if we're trying to protect that Russell and something happens overnight, something happens on Sunday morning, well, I know Sunday night I can begin working that trade. I don't have to wait till Monday morning. Uh, and I think, I guess from my mental point of view, I feel more comfortable with the safety net that it's out there. When the market closes, I know the stock market closes. I know my hedge position is still out right. there protecting me. So I, I would lean towards the futures options. Uh, you know, everybody has their particular ones. But I think for me, that's the characteristic that I kind of think about. And you brought up a, a really good point, Dan, and that is what these three products have in common. The hedge is the futures contract, right? So. Um, no matter which one of these three you're trading, if you're hedging this with, uh, you're using CME's Russell futures to hedge these. So it's uh, uh, something in common with some of those little differences along these products as well. Well said, everybody. That music means we come to the end. Man, an hour flies by when we're talking all things futures options. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. In addition to your detailed Tax questions, Sean, our CPA here on the side. In addition to those, <laughs> Mr. Smith, if folks want to reach out to you over there at Footsie Russell Land, where should they go and what can they look forward to you guys in terms of webinars and all the other good stuff coming up, sir? Uh, please go to uh, footsierussell.com for all the information regarding uh, uh, webinars that we've recently had. Yesterday we had a webinar with our partners at SGX in the evolving of uh, Asia of the Asian distribu- uh, derivatives landscape. It was a fantastic webinar with uh, with SGX, with Goldman Sachs, and uh, uh, FTSE Russell representative, my partner in, in uh, the derivatives business at FTSE Russell, Ricardo Manrique. Uh, they did a fantastic job. And just this morning, we had a webinar, What's Been Driving U.S. Market Outperformance? And I, I think you've been blasting these out, Mark, but they're now available on uh, our website, and I can push the links to you guys so that... Uh, um, you could t- you could take a look at those as well. Um, and just to recap, the, the the new product coming out on Force Italiana, the Fuzzy Mib. I think I got tongue tied trying to say that earlier in the show. Uh, and thank you for rescuing me, Dan. But uh, the the micro on the Fuzzy Mib is uh, a, another interesting product coming out uh, at Force Italiana, and it's it's something that I like to say is a global index. Is is as so many of the products we talk about on the show are. You know, the Russell suite of products, which uh, are U.S. domestic, and the Russell one is a little more on, on a global perspective. But the, that FTSE MIB is is absolutely a, a global product that uh, folks should be taking a look at. So um, I can also get you the information in regards to that presentation that Dan and I did together earlier this week. But that's it. Um, S. Smith at FTSERussell.com. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, FTSEERussell.com is the website where you can find all of this. And uh Look forward to uh, another great show. And, Dan, great to be on the show with you today. Uh, Thanks, Sean. I feel the same way. Great being with you and Mark. It's really a great way that you guys frame all these different topics. Uh, I really enjoy that. And I hope this presidential election idea wasn't too much of a drama, but it may be something to take a peek at as we go forward. Uh, Also, uh, if you wanted to look at something that I do I guess when it comes to websites would be just dangramsa.com and it's a free daily video Uh, in fact I finished it today for tomorrow done every day when the markets are open there will be a video and it looks at 22 different markets and it looks at stock and Texas currencies interest rate metals energy and agricultural markets uh And if you've never traded futures, a place to begin is just watch them. And this goes through the analysis of what I look at. And uh, there's red and green lines, which represent buy and sell levels from my point of view, not making recommendations for anyone. It's watching over 150 countries, so I'm not really sure what the qualifications are of everyone who's watching it. But it, it just gives you an idea of how someone's looking at these markets, of what clues are they looking for, how are they trying to manage these positions. And you can look at historical videos, I think, going back a few years. So you could say, all right, what did he say when this happened? And you could go back and look at that video. 
Uh, so it's another resource that you have uh, to maybe take a peek at. There you go. Check it out. DanGramza.com. That's G-R-A-M-Z-A.com. Go over there. You can see Dan smiling face, smiling back at you. By the way, I have to, I'm a little disconcerted. You guys are off there doing content by yourselves without me. But if you want to check those out over there during the week, all the webinars and everything else that Sean and Dan alluded to, you can check them out at FTSERussell.com as well. Of course, check out our friends over there to get the reports and the research and everything else. You know where to go. See them in group dot com slash twifo or slash twio is the place to go for the reports of course they have all that great research and education from blue and the research team the education team everything else over there you can spend hours over there including links to a cool show called this week in futures options what more could you ask for from a derivatives oriented outlet and on behalf of dan and sean and our friends over there in cme land and indeed myself I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming for listening live, of course. We'll see you back here tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, for a little bit of volatility viewing. Then it all kicks off again on Monday with the option block all the way through to Thursday and another episode of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.